I think that um, actually Alp and Gregorio work in, I guess, very different areas. And firstly, I mean, they're mostly working on the application side of, of ZK for the moment, right? Um, and so it's, it's not so much about the cryptographic techniques as the applications and what you can do with these new technologies. And, but actually they work in very, very different areas. Whereas Alp is focused mostly on the security and proving, proving like formally, trying to formally verify certain properties of ZK circuits. Gregorio is working on some applications that he's going to tell you about a little bit about uh, in a second. But yeah, let me start off with some intros. So uh, Gregorio is the uh, CEO of Runtime Verification, a company that has historically worked on the K-Prover and a lot of other for cool form verification techniques, but also auditing. And now they're going into a new foray, they're working on some ZK stuff, which he's going to tell you about. And uh, Al oh yeah, you're also a professor of all methods at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, important. Uh, so, and Alp is a form verification engineer at Veridice and also I ho believe holds a PhD in mathematics. Uh, so, and, and yeah, so any, anything else you guys want to add intro-wise or is that, that, does that cover most of the things? Okay, so, uh, so I'll just hand over the floor to you guys to talk a little bit about the individual projects that you're working on a little bit. So, Gregorio, would you like to start? Perfect. All right, thank you. So traditionally, um, oh, sorry. Oh, traditionally we um, at runtime verification do runtime verification and formal verification and make sure that programs do what they are supposed to do mathematically rigorously. But uh, recently we became interested in uh, combining that with zero knowledge technology. Because in the end, if you think about formal verification and zero knowledge, or verifiable computing, let's say more generally, as a concept, verifiable computing, they both attack the same problem from different angles. They both attempt to prove correctness of computational claims. Some of them are very concrete claims, like this program evaluates to 42, Others are a bit more complex claims, like uh, this uh, bytecode implements an ERC-20 token. But in the end, they are both mathematical statements, or theorems, I will call them. And they admit mathematical proofs. And now if we can verify those mathematical proofs, then in particular we can verify computations. So we became very interested recently into combining these two different approaches to correctness that were developed by almost disjoint communities. These were done by formal verification, formal methods people, mathematicians, and these were done by cryptographers. And they follow different paths, but now we believe it's time to bring it together and, um, and have one approach to correctness that goes through mathematical proofs. So in both of them, in the end, you can generate mathematical proofs, mathematical proof of correct execution of the program, mathematical proof of the requirements that the program satisfies, and then generate a verifiable computing argument, a ZK proof, or a certificate, cryptographic evidence, cryptographic proof that the mathematical proof exists for the claim, so the claim is true. And uh, that's what we are doing now. Um, so I'm Alp, uh, I'm a research scientist at Veridice. Uh, Veridice is a blockchain security uh, and auditing company. So I myself come from a more mathematical background. I used to do research in number theory and algebraic geometry and applications to cryptography for a long time. For, uh, but now at Veridice, what we do is, I mean, Veridice is, comes also from kind of an academic background. The founders are researchers, mainly in formal methods, and um, the aim is kind of to use formal methods in auditing. Yeah, so what we do is, uh, I mean, how it evolved basically was um, there were many auditing projects uh, and of course, I mean, we do lots of manual audits, but um, there's a big need for tools and we had some in-house tools that we used to use a lot and since many people come from a formal methods background, they were based on various levels of uh, uh, sophistication coming from formal methods like some basic simple fuzzing methods, some static analysis, or uh, more like SMT based methods and so on uh, with the, the whole hierarchy. And then 
um, since we had developed those tools in-house and we were using them very nicely, we thought, let's make them available. So now uh, Veritas is also offering uh, these uh, auditing tools as a service uh, that uh, will be, I mean, some of them are open already. You can use and experiment them. And we, we do workshops about them. And uh, from those workshops, we get, like, people can use them directly and we get feedback, which we again, feed into the tools themselves, and it's kind of a, um, like a loop going back and forth. Uh, yeah, but that's basically what we're doing here. Great, thank you so much for the, the intro, guys. And by the way, Gregorio, you didn't mention the name of the project. This is okay to do so. Yes. Yeah, so the project is called Pi Squared. I think it's important to mention. <laughs> so yeah, that, so thanks, thanks for the intro to your projects, guys. Um, and yeah, I know incidentally for both of you, the pain when you're working in formal methods, but also, uh, you know, ZK stuff, the word proof is highly overloaded. So, you know, so we use the term cryptographic and mathematical proof to try Actually, and... Actually, pi squared yes. comes from proof of proof. Oh, oh, I like that. I didn't know the etymology. Cryptographic proof of mathematical. You want to say that so it can be heard, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> right. So the name of the project, yes, it's pi squared. And pi squared comes from proof of proof. Mm -hmm. uh, because you have a cryptographic proof of a mathematical proof. The ultimate evidence of correctness. <laughs> that, that's a great tagline. The ultimate evidence of correctness. I love it. Great, great, great. Um, cool. So, uh, so my next qu the next question I wanted to ask you guys, and I think it, um, it was meant to be more so for Grigore and um, and Misha, but Misha isn't here, so you're really going to have to carry <laughs> carry this one, Grigore, uh, because I imagine Alp that you heard. I was going to ask basically, when did you first hear about zkps? And did you immediately see the potential of the technology? And I imagine, Alp, you've heard about ZKPs quite some time ago, a given your area of work. So, uh, well, well, okay, well, I mean, you can feel, still feel free, to, feel, feel free to answer the question, of course. And, uh, but yeah, I'll hand that over to Grigore. One to two. Oh, okay, okay, Alp starts, yeah, why not? We can, we can go in both directions. Yeah, so, I mean, for me, it was kind of interesting. I mean, I was doing initially research on uh, the arithmetic of curves and, um, so at some point, Ronald Kramer from the CWI approached me. He says, okay, I'm working on secret sharing schemes, multi-party computation, and, uh, which are kind of a basic primitive for most of CK. And he had some very hands-on question on algebraic curves. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's kind of the first time I, uh, I mean, I, I, because, I mean, basically because of elliptic curve cryptography, I was kind of aware of many applications of algebraic geometry in cryptography, but this was a very novel thing, and, um, and that was the first time when I first, that was when I was a postdoc still, the first time I was kind of, uh, when, when I saw the uh, concept of a zero knowledge proof and so on, and that's kind of, uh, for me it was kind of quite interesting to see it, because like with most cryptographic constructions that you have around there, they are based on some contradiction in some sense, like there, there's something that intuitively you think should not be possible, uh, but it is possible, and that's kind of the surprising side of it. I mean, it's uh, like zero knowledge should not be possible if you ask someone on the street, and if you look, it's used everywhere, so it is possible in the end. And uh, that, that's kind of, that contradiction I found very intriguing, and I think that's also something that uh, shows that it has a lot of um, kind of future, because kind of if something is not so intuitive, you really need some time for people to come up with ideas of using those things after some point because it's not immediately apparent how you could use something that is not intuitive at all. So, yeah. so that was my first encounter with uh, ZK. All right, yeah, I guess um, I heard lots of people talking about it and I was uh, intrigued what it is, um, zero knowledge. In fact, there is a lot of knowledge. <laughs> 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 um, and um, yes, it looked impossible. Once I understood the problem that was solving, I said, that, that's impossible. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I started reading. Um, and I remember I read uh, Thaler's book. Mm. Uh, and I was so, um, so fascinated by the whole concept. And then, um, you know, how you can combine different, you know, witnesses into one witness. And all that became like an obsession. It's, it's very addictive mm. once you get into it. And um, I don't know when it happened, but at some point, I said, wait a minute. Actually, we can do exactly the same with mathematical proofs. <laughs> we can um, generate, so the, the mathematical proof of the theorem is the witness, why the theorem is correct. 
and now I can uh, I can uh, generate a succinct argument that I have uh, such such a mathematical proof, and 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 then then I became obsessed with it. I said, okay, we really have to understand this very well. Go deep into the rabbit hole and understand everything. And then we discovered uh, the different implementations around, particularly of ZKEVMs, uh, like the ZKEVM, and we try to understand what is the trust base of that, because this is such a complicated monster, and we doing formal verification, we are, of course, obsessed with correctness. Mm -hmm. yes. Why should I trust one million lines of code, basically? Uh, yeah. uh, that's so complicated. And uh, I don't know if anybody verifies ZK EVM, but I would not do it. <laughs> no matter how much they would pay us, I would not take a project, a runtime verification. Uh, maybe very nice, I don't know, but we would not do that, definitely. Um, Depends how the pays. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and then maybe now I should uh, answer a bit, you know, on Michel's uh, behalf. <laughs> yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> my, my <laughs> now I'm Michel, no, the long yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very thin. Um, <laughs> right, so, so um, you know, the next thought that comes to mind is why not to generate, correct by construction, ideally, all these uh, VMs. Um, mm -hmm. Give me your program, in particular, an implementation of its EVM, of of a VM, be it EVM or is five or whatever, and I'm going to generate for you from the implementation a ZK variant of your VM. It's a wonderful uh, thought, but now you have another problem. Why is the compiler correct? <laughs> Maybe you can do translation validation. You can take for each instance, you can generate a proof, but then you still have to first say what the proof is for, <laughs> which means that you need the semantics of the programming language, the semantics of the, of the target language. It's a very complicated problem, even then. Um, and then I put my back, my, my head. Wrong time, yeah. <laughs> 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 never mind. Oh, yeah. oh OK. <laughs> um, and then he said, wait a minute. Maybe if we go through mathematics, maybe we don't need a VM at all for a programming language. Because when you have a formal semantics of a language or of a VM, you actually have a mathematical theory. And now whenever I make any claim about that programming language, in particular the program evaluates to 42 or the bytecode is uh, an ERC20 uh, compliant uh, code, that has a mathematical proof. So now if I can verify mathematical proofs, I get exactly the same guarantee that I would get if I had um, a ZKVM, right? Mm -hmm. And then the next challenge is, well, how difficult would it be to verify mathematical proofs? And it turns out that that's a much, much simpler problem, and that's what uh, brought us into this. Mm -hmm. So there is a proof checker, for example, for mathematical proofs that has like 200 lines of code. That's it. That's the only trust base, 200 lines of code. And now if we can uh, implement that as a ZK circuit and prove it correct, actually I think that is feasible, right? To take 200 lines of code and have a circuit for them and prove it correct completely. I would take that project, actually. We already took it. Actually you have, yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, so that's, um, yeah, so I heard of ZKPs for a long time, that's not your question now, but I became interested in it about one year ago and I became obsessed with it about six months ago. And uh, now we want to do this Pi Square project. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for your answers. Um, just in response to some of the things that you said, the first thing is, um, um, Alp, I really empathize with you saying that, hey, you were aware of these cryptographic primitives and that I remember I wanted to do my master's thesis on modular forms with a, a number theorist at my university when I was studying maths. And uh, I told him, you know, oh yeah, there are, I've heard there are some cryptographic applications to this. And he said, yeah, I write those on grants sometimes. So, <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah, anyways. Um, but yeah, so, so thanks for your answers on this. That's been very interesting. And uh, yeah, specifically this 200, these 200 lines of code are the verifier for, um, damn, what's a very simple proof? Um, 
uh, well, proof assistant called, uh, I thought I called from him. Meta, meta. Meta math, math, yeah, meta math, yeah. So this is a meta math proof checker, right, yeah. So, but I, I think in the end you're going for a slightly different direction, right? But, but still, yeah, it's quite feasible to do this in a very succinct way and then actually pr verify the underlying circuits against the spec of the, of the proof language. Yeah, but that's quite amazing. Um, okay, so I think next, for my next question is going to be, and once again, you're going to have radically different answers, I expect, uh, will be essentially what have been significant technological, um, what do you call it, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for, like difficulties that you've had, right? So I assume you will say something to do with SNT solvers, I might be wrong, uh, but, but I, I feel like I'm likely to be right here. And Grigona, your answer will be more to do with cryptographic primitives, perhaps, or, or maybe the compilation process or something like that, but, you know, let me answer, let me let you answer my question, <laughs> you know, so I'll hand it to Grigona in front. Thank you. Um, so our first challenge was to understand ZK, um, of course, yeah. the mathematics and everything. And also we are mathematically trained, all of us, mm -hmm. uh, mostly PhDs and with formal mathematical background. Um, we started questioning everything, and that's the problem with people like us. <laughs> Whenever we read something, it takes us like 10 times longer yeah. than uh, yeah. it should, because uh, we've seen this before somewhere, it didn't work, and why should it work here, and so on. That was one, one step. Another was to actually decide how to implement these 200 lines of code as a circuit, right? So we tried all the existing solutions, right? Cairo, uh, Risk Zero, ZK LSDM, and uh, and uh, now we're also playing with Lurk. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, actually, Misha, if Misha were here, he knows we communicate almost every other day where we get stuck with something. So it was <laughs> quite tough to make these systems work, right? There is a lot of enthusiasm around about this system, but when you try them out, they are not that easy, right? So we had only 200 lines of code to implement, and we are all experts in programming languages and software engineering and compilers. It should have been easy. Julian knows. He tried <laughs> yeah, to yeah. implement. I tried to write one. I tried to write a method. We spent like two. You spent two or three days with yeah, yeah, yeah. Home, a super strong formal verification person, right? And they yeah. tried to implement and they gave up, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we got we got some nice parts of the core proof checker working, but in the end, yeah, we completely fell prey to some issues with uh, like right. We keep discovering traits. bugs in, in these tools. In right? the compiler, and, yeah. And then they say, oh, bugs. yeah, we want to fix that. Then we'll, we will fix it. We will have it in two days. You know? Then one week later, hey, what is going on? Ah, in two more days, and so on. I mean, it's, it's the way things are. These are very difficult. Uh, mm. Um, to to yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So that was that was a challenge for us, and it's still a challenge. We, we are working in parallel with four different implementations, and when they work, they are extremely slow. Um, <laughs> the elephant. Uh, of the course, room. everybody has this problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The performance. So now we are thinking of implementing a custom circuit, uh, going down to the basics, specifically for mathematics, and uh, see how it goes. And then to have very nice audited for us. <laughs> <laughs> Happily. <laughs> Happily. Yeah. And another mind. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you mentioned already the keywords or difficulties with SMT. And yeah, um, we've had some fun with that too. Getting them to to model model finite fields is not, you know, super fun. Uh, no, it's okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it's just a very nice promise that SMT gives. This says, okay, I'll prove it to you. I'll, I'll do this. Of course. I'll, <laughs> so. But then there's the bottleneck because at the end, um, it boils down to polynomial equations, solving mm -hmm. them, and so on. So, I mean, basically, like in some of our tools, just to give some background, what we do is, for instance, um, if we want to look for a particular bug, like we want to check if your circuits are under constraint or something like that, you can express that as a logical formula. Right? And then you, all you have to see is whether that formula is satisfiable. It's not just the usual Boolean satisfiability where you look some, for some interpretation where you just assign fruit values to the variables. There's some other theory involved, so that's why it's called SMT, so satisfiability modulo theory. In this case, it will be the theory of finite fields and uh, like polynomial equations over finite fields and so on, but then you can ask similar problems. Given some statement in this theory, can I, can I kind of decide whether it is true uh, or false? If, it, if it's satisfiable, can I find the model? If it is not satisfiable, can I kind of uh, convey that in a simple way? And uh, what happens the, uh, at the end, I mean, if you use most of the SMT solvers, um, especially if you do satisfiability modular theory where the theory is finite fields, you boil down everything to solving polynomial equations over finite fields, and that is an inherently difficult problem. That's something for 
decades people in computer algebra and in computative algebra have been working on. They're very nice algorithms. They work very nice theoretically. They're extremely powerful. Uh, but then when it comes to practice, when you implement it, small examples, they work. So you get the feeling, oh, it's wonderful. If your examples grow a bit, I mean, they have doubly exponential worst time performance, they get stuck. And that was our biggest problem. One of our biggest problems, at least, uh, that I have been working on is, was how to make those faster. I mean, that's kind of a, basically a question in algebraic geometry, basically. It's, uh, you have these polynomial equations, can you solve them? Or can you show that they have no solutions? And that's kind of what has caused us some sleepless nights, but uh, <laughs> I think we did quite some improvement there. Right. No. I guess the arithmetization part, that should be easier to prove, right? That a certain arithmetization is correct, right? Because that's, this is pure SMT in some sense, right? The yes. polynomial part is difficult. Yeah. Yeah. But do you need to solve the polynomials or you just need to check that something is a solution for a polynomial? Uh, you need to solve them. Yeah, I mean, if you have a solution, that would, for instance, show you that it's under constraints. Yes, yes. And then the solution will tell you, okay, like, this input gives two different outputs. Or it's for this circuit, there are two different proofs, or, uh, so, or those kind of things. Or so so in, in particular, you, sorry, yeah. In particular, you want to find two satisfying assignments of a circuit, where in particular, and you want to assert then that they're not equal, essentially, right? And you want to then show that that's not satisfiable. Sorry, I mean. Uh, Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And in fact, that's a very nice trick. If you want to show that two things are not equal, there's yet another, you can express that as yet another equality. So yes, you just yeah, yeah. add that as another equality, and yeah. then you take two copies of the same circuit, and then yeah. you say these two should be different, which you then translate into equality, which will be yet another equality mm -hmm. on them. So it's basically solving polynomial equations. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, so actually, so uh, obviously Nevermind developed, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit from my experience if that's okay, I'll, we developed a tool for reasoning about Cairo, right, which obviously required, well Cairo Zero specifically, which obviously required reasoning about finite fields, and our trick was that we uh, just restricted the set of theories we use in an SMT solver as heavily as possible, so we only use nonlinear integer arithmetic. And it, under very restricted conditions, we had higher order nonlinear integer arithmetic. But I believe that you guys have uh, actually developed a, 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 what do you call it, um, a new SNT theory, in fact, specifically for finite fields, right? Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about? Uh, and do you actually use this in the tool currently? And can you tell us a little bit about? I think it uses like Montgomery representations, right? Can you tell us a little bit about how that improved the the solving performance? Or yeah, okay, cheers. <laughs> Actually. Uh, I mean, so what we did was, um, like the first step, I mean, that was uh, uh, helpful, was to not rely only on SMT. I mean, there's like the static analysis tools that you can use that kind of just looks at the syntax and looks for particular uh, vulnerabilities, for instance. And that's very fast. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's not so reliable because it can give you many false positives, for instance, and it's just, you look for very particular things there. And then there's the SMT, which is kind of much stronger. You get guarantees and um, you get proofs out of it, but it's very slow. And uh, so we first developed one tool that we call PyCus. It's also available, uh, open. You can t download it and experiment with it, which kind of combines the two. So it's kind of an interactive loop between the static analysis phase and this SMT phase where whenever one of them gets into trouble, it passes it on to the other and says, oh, can you say something? And sometimes they both get into trouble and that's <laughs> usually the case when the SMT phase just is uh, kind of confronted with a very difficult polynomial system. Mm -hmm. And then, so at the end, the bottleneck was how to solve difficult polynomial equations and difficult means like those circuits can be huge, they can have many variables and many equations and so on. We are talking in the thousands sometimes and that's beyond anything that normal com computer algebra systems would really care about because I mean, those computer algebra systems that are around, they were done mainly by people working on computative algebra and algebraic geometry and they never write down equations with thousands of equations, mm -hmm. uh, polynomial equations yeah. usually. They are, of course, but that's not their initial goal. 
So then we had to kind of see how to solve those because relying on the tools that, that were available did not help. But then uh, what's not interesting is that the circuits that one deals with in ZK applications, they have a very particular form. They're very sparse, right? So if you take one equation, it will only involve very few of the variables, right? And they will have, for instance, if you have R1CS constraints and so on, you will have bounds on the degrees. They'll be just quadratic <coughs> equations. So it's not just a random, if you take an arbitrary, like random uh, polynomial equation, whatever that means, that's not gonna be how uh, a polynomial equation coming from a circuit will look like. So they'll be very sparse, they'll have a lot of structure. And what we wanted to do then is to exploit the structure. So to that polynomial equation, we attached some graphs that kind of showed us how the polynomials, how the variables appearing in those polynomials are related to each other. And uh, from that, uh, we could push things way further. I mean, like just to give a very simple example, and many ZK applications, you have some range checks, which say, says, for instance, that the variable X is between zero and two to the 14, for instance, right? And if you express this as a polynomial, you would have to write down a polynomial whose roots are all the numbers between zero and two to the 14, which would have then degree two to the 14, and that's a huge number, yeah? So range checks appear a lot, but they are not uh, things that you should express in polynomials but the SMT solvers do express them in polynomials. That's, for instance, just one example that uh, kind of using just the methods as they are given, SMT solvers, the big promise, if you use it without thinking, it will be a, a, a big disaster. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, do we have two minutes left? We do, we do. Yeah. Okay, two minutes. So I wanted to ask one last question, um, but, but yeah, if you could keep it relatively short, just given the time constraints which was uh, essentially, do you see problem, upcoming problems that you're going to solve? So what are, are the next problems you guys are going to face and how do you think you're going to solve them? I, I know it's one minute each, it's, it's a bit tough for that question, but hey, let's give it a try. <laughs> I think the problem would be to parallelize um, the ZKP generation. Um, if we don't find embarrassingly parallel algorithms to generate ZKPs, at least in our case, will never be uh, as efficient as we need to. That will be the challenge. Okay, thank you. I mean, for me, I'll just use the easy way out. I'll say it will depend on which problems we'll see. I mean, because like our tools, we use them on audits and then we see where the bottlenecks are. And that gives us a nice feedback of which parts we have to improve, where, where we have the problems. So it depends on which projects want audits at the end and then what, what the problem, what our tools have uh, issues with them. That would be kind of the direction. Great, thank, thank you very much. We did keep it to two minutes, I believe. <laughs> that was perfect. Thank, thank you so guys. much. Thanks, Arthur. Thank you so much to both panelists. Thank you, Guido, and thank you, Al. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hear how both of your projects keep going. Right. Thank you so much.